right, welcome to our second Big 12 Mental Health Providers Roundtable discussion. As we prepare for the opening of our campuses, both across our campus, or across our campuses and across the country, there's been a lot of discussions taking place on how COVID-19 has caused disruption in everybody's daily life. One of the many important aspects to be aware of is the potential negative impact this crisis can have on our mental and physical health. The uncertainty we all deal with on a daily basis takes a toll and it's critical to be mindful on how we approach the uncertainty that we all deal with on that daily basis. So with that in mind, uh, this group of Big 12 mental health providers is gathering with the purpose of providing resources and recommendations that may be beneficial to student athlete well-being in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Trevor Richardson. I'm the Director of Counseling and Sports Psychology at OSU, and I'm gonna ask the rest of our distinguished panel to go ahead and introduce themselves before we proceed with our discussion. Hi, I'm Dr. Monique Marshbell. I'm the Assistant Athletic Director for Mental Health Services at Baylor University. Good morning, I'm Marty Martinez, Coordinator of Sports Psychology Services at Iowa State University. Hi there, I'm Dr. Annie Weiss, the Director of Mental Wellness and Sports Psychology at Kansas State University. Hello, I'm Dr. Cody Commander, Director of Psychological Resources for Oklahoma uh, Student Athletes. Good morning, I'm Ashley Harmon. I'm the Assistant Director of Clinical Behavioral Health at Texas. And I'm Kylie Eumanns, Social Worker at Texas. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Tyler Bradstreet. I'm the Director of Clinical and Sports Psychology at Texas Tech University. And lastly, I'm Dr. Dana Charbonneau. I'm our Director of Clinical and Sports Psychology here at West Virginia University. And today, Tyler, Trevor, Tyler, <laughs> today Trevor and I are gonna moderate our discussion with um, our wonderful panelists as we talk about um, the mental health impact of COVID as we're returning to campus. And so we're gonna kind of throw some questions at the group and facilitate this discussion. And let's just start with, what are some of the biggest challenges that our student athletes may be facing as they come back to campus related to COVID concerns and also their mental health? <clears throat> Both the beauty and the challenge um, of that question is um, everyone can be so unique. Everyone can have all of the concerns, whether it's physical, uh, emotional, um, wondering if they're going to, how their season's going to go. Um, but each one's going to be unique. Um, and, our, uh, and our great use of our listening skills um, and empathy skills will be put to the test. Yeah, I think that's, you know, spot on for me, you know, there's so many different things that you could respond to with that question. And I think the way I've been thinking about it over the last couple of days is just like the psychology of uncertainty. I think that's probably the best way to capture it with whatever we're talking about. You're coming into this environment and everything we've been talking about, um, whether it's, you know, sociopolitical things, COVID, what is the, you know, academic or sports schedule going to look like? Everything is just... I don't think any, anybody knows, right? I even think about even just in my own job and all the different maybe policies and procedures we've created and we've had to do plan A, plan B, plan C, or if this happens, how do we manage this? And just thinking about for a student athlete sitting in that place of constant uncertainty, that, that continued stress response, trying to figure out how to navigate through all this, like for me, that's just, I mean, that's not a healthy place or a good place for anybody to really be in. And I think that's really um, how I've tried to characterize it here. Yeah, and I'll tag on to that, Tyler. We've noticed a lot of what we've been seeing falls under the umbrella of grief. And so whether or not it's still continuing to grieve from March or sitting in that state of uncertainty this whole summer and then the anticipatory grief of what the fall is going to look like and having no idea um, what to expect and trying to make plans when there's when literally no one knows um, and no one's hiding anything from them just there's just not answers yet and we I mean we've definitely noticed their resilience to deal with it and take it little bit by bit but um, the transitions along the way combined with the grief are kind of what are making it so difficult to have any sort of normal right now for them. 
I also definitely think some of our athletes feel like they're getting back to normal and they have these expectations that their season's going to look similar to how it has in the past and they're coming back, they're getting back into practice and classes are starting. And so they're really excited about that, which is great, but we don't know how it's going to be from day to day. And so it's kind of this really up and down that they're experiencing around there's some normalcy, but then there's a lot of things that are still really uncertain. Yeah, and I think with that comes managing those expectations and finding creative ways to stay motivated and engaged in the limited amount of contact they're able to have with their sport um, to get them where they need to be if their season even occurs. And one of the things, in addition to what everyone's noticed here at Kansas State, something that I've come across is just that it maybe especially in female athletes, the changes in the body and like getting the body back and um, how they've dealt with the isolation and the quarantine and, and feeling, you know, you know, working toward that physical shape has been a challenge as well. I think another thing in addition to what you guys were saying too is there's actually competing needs. So uh, the health needs um, to prevent uh, them from getting Corona or COVID-19 comes with limitations of other areas of functioning. So right now we're trying to create bubbles around student athletes. So they're not having unnecessary social interactions. So uh, if they're going to be healthy and try to have a fall season, that's going to limit their social interactions. That is a big part of the college life. And so uh, we know with athletes, they love routine. They like knowing what they're going to be doing uh, during the week and during the weekends and, and things like that too. And so the hard part's going to be is now we're putting them in more stressful environments of having to make sure that they're uh, not getting infected with the virus while also limiting uh, their coping skills and, and social outlets. And so um, there's going to be uh, some issues in making sure that their mental health is, uh, is doing well uh, with those competing needs. Those are all great points. And so we're, uh, we're curious what specific types of programming or services have our different schools been putting in place for this response to the pandemic? At Texas, um, we have done a couple of web series. So we did one for our athletes that included things like grief and loss, sleep and mindfulness. And then we did um, a six week one for our coaches that included each, each week was a different mental health topic, but also included how COVID was impacting those specific mental health topics. Um, we also implemented this free headspace for our athletes and all of our coaches. Um, and we remind them weekly through Teamworks and last, we kind of did a series um, or a webinar for our staff also on things that they can expect and how ways they can take care of themselves. You know, I think it's been tough, right? There's so many different things going on and everybody's trying to figure out how to support student athletes with different programming, whether it's around you know, returning related to coronavirus or obviously a lot of the conversations have been around George Floyd and systemic racism. I think one of the struggles has been like how, how not to do too much or how not to stretch the athletes too thin with Zoom meetings and things like that. Um, and I know for sure, uh, you know, we're trying to think about what programming needs to look like in the fall just to help them. Up until this point here, what we've been trying to do is just utilize the resources or the programming we kind of already have in place but then focus it on these topics, right? And so you know, at Texas Tech, we do have that partnership with Headspace for staff and student athletes. And so making sure we're putting that out through the lens of how it can help you with this kind of return or thinking about coronavirus related anxiety, um, kind of retooling our monthly sports medicine newsletter to focus on these topics. Um, and then when we do you know, monthly team meetings, making sure that we're spending time talking about this and in addition to any maybe uh, mental performance training topic. That way we're at least kind of giving the athletes a space to talk about it, but then also um, provide some level of education um, that can be helpful for them just from a overall wellness standpoint. We've also done training with our, our coaches and staff around transition and grief. Um, and we plan to do another one of those. And similar to what Tyler said, we also have a newsletter and so we've been pushing out information about mental health in the newsletter. 
And anytime they get information about um, their physical health and kind of things that they need to be doing, we try to at least put a little mental health tidbit in there because they're more likely to read that sometimes than if mental health just kind of puts out its own information. So we try to sneak little mental health information into other things that they may be more apt to actually read the full thing or look at the full video. Yeah, at Kansas State, we've made a mindfulness group available to athletes um, virtually, um, more frequent team check-ins, just really reminding them of the services available, um, providing psychoeducation to coaches, similar to what other folks are saying, and then uh, really partnering with our um, tech guys and um, using social media to, help, to also provide some resources and some tips on how to um, adjust to this as well. Yep. yep. At Iowa State, it's uh, <clears throat> um, presence, just trying to be as present as possible, um, getting um, information out to the students individually, um, you know, with the ups uncertainties of how, how they're going to meet, when they're going to meet as a team, when we're going to be able to kind of participate with their team. Um, we've really uh, sent out emails. We have a newsletter that gets sent out to every student and again information there, resources, links. Um, and so it's been real heavy with the, trying the individual approach uh, once the teams get back on uh, more of a, a team approach. Go for it. I was going to ask the next question but we uh, want to hear about OU first. Um, so I think in addition to some of those programming, uh, we've also adjusted our pre-performance evaluations to screen for anxiety related to COVID-19. And then also we've partnered with our, with our athletic trainers and medical staff to ensure that anyone who gets tested positive or has contacts, um, we are specifically reaching out to them individually to see how they're doing and checking on them while they're in isolation and quarantine. I think that's a really good point. Um, just a couple of conversations that have come up you know, in the last couple of weeks here is just athletes talking about how, yeah, I mean, how isolating that experience was. And we, you know, obviously it's even more stressful when it's for a positive test, but I, you know, even just talking to our athletes who were considered close contacts uh, with other teammates that were um, actually positive, you know, I think that was, that was just as stressful. And we also had several athletes who were considered close contacts on numerous occasions and you know, I think that's a really tough place to be where you know you're trying to follow the rules so you don't potentially infect someone else, but you're being quarantined for, you know, 10 to 14 days at a time. And really there's nothing, you know, you come to find out there's nothing wrong with you. You don't have the coronavirus. And so I just think, yeah, being able to check in with them, at least provide that support from a mental health standpoint in terms of just the, the struggles of being isolated away from your apartment, typically, you know, here at Texas Tech, we've been uh, putting them up in different places, either on campus or in our community that are partnering with us and knowing it's just a, a very sterile and just not your kind of home comfortable environment. Yeah, and to uh, go a little bit deeper, Tyler, into that, so there's been, there's been some who were uh, isolated who uh, were contact and um, actually had more problematic mental health concerns because it almost made it feel real. Um, when I think, you know, with that age group, um, you, it's, all, it's easy to have the feeling like it's not gonna happen to me, like I'm not gonna get it, you know, I'm invincible because, you know, I'm uh, this, this age and, and things like that. But then uh, when you're put in isolation as if you had it and as if you had, uh, you know, a threatening uh, illness yeah. and virus, virus, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, disassociate yourself from that and it, it makes it more real. And so regardless if they have or don't have it, they're still having that psychological symptoms, uh, of the, the mental health concerns that, that go along with the two. And, and that lasts even after, after the isolation, because now they may be more worried about getting it because they know what the consequences are going to feel like of isolation. And so, um, what we're seeing is not just mental health concerns during those 10 to 14 days, but also afterwards uh, for who knows how long, um, because now when they're going to their environment, uh, they're being triggered by every, everything else, you know, all the safety precautions that we're doing <clears throat> are constant triggers and reminders of, of that isolation of what they could experience as if they, they contract COVID-19. And then an, another aspect I've run into, uh, not very much, but with a, a couple student athletes is 
hey, I want to go ahead and get it so that way I'm done with it. That way it doesn't interrupt my season. And then trying to reinforce what our medical staff is saying, hey, we don't know. As of right now, you know, antibiotics are supposed to last you know, potentially three months. So then that puts you at risk, you know, right in the middle of the season or something like that. So just then the, the re-education on encouraging them to do things right, to take care of themselves physically, uh, as well as that mental health side. So it's, there's all sorts of challenges. Well, and as you're all sharing what you're doing from a programming perspective and just starting to think about how are we really promoting this proactive approach to taking care of our mental health when we're potentially going to have to pivot constantly over the course of the fall. I'm just curious for, from you all, what are some of those specific um, things that you're sharing either with staff members with how they can prioritize their mental health during this time and with your student athletes? You know, I don't know if I have a good uh, recommendation or even just thinking about what we're doing here, but just with the question, I think what I'm reminded of is the staff piece, right? You know, I try to always encourage creating a culture of health that emphasizes, um, you know, obviously taking care of your well-being, your mental health, and how that starts at the top, right? How do, how do we expect our student athletes to take care of themselves if we have staff, as staff members aren't doing that? We're not setting up that culture. And I think academic or athletics in general um, is a place that doesn't really uh, easily support that. It just in any time, right? It's such a dynamic, fast-paced environment. You know, people tend to work long hours. There's a lot of expectations. And so even just thinking about, you know, working within sports medicine and seeing how many additional responsibilities are being added on to our medical staff's plate. You know, we have athletic trainers who are now essentially functioning as infectious disease specialists, right? Trying to help navigate this and manage it. And just talk about the sheer potential for burnout above and beyond that's already there. Um, again, I don't know that um, we're, I mean, honestly, I don't think we're having that conversation here like we should be just because of how busy everyone is. But, you know, if you start playing this out down the road, like this is going to be an issue, not just for student athletes, but for our staff members, um, um, it's definitely, I think this is a great question that I would like to have highlighted at, you know, our, my university, our universities at our conference level and really just think about like, hey, we probably need to take a look at this and really emphasize how important this is. Yeah, my, my department's going to probably think that mindfulness is the only thing I know how to teach or only thing I promote, but it, in all of these transitions and uncertainty, I am double, doubling down on this idea of learning how to ground and center yourself amidst the chaos. And, you know, not grabbing after every piece in the snow globe, but, but sitting down and, and letting it settle and watching it and observing. And, um, and sitting, and I know some of our athletes feel like so uncertain and then also in a, in a power down and um, a loss of control. And so uh, again, I'm harping mindfulness and I, I, I live and breathe by it. And I'm, that's something that I'm, I'm trying to teach as many people as I can, staff, administration, um, our sports medicine folks, and especially our athletes. Well said, Annie. You made me want to take a deeper breath right, right now. <laughs> right along those lines, I had a great conversation with a couple of our athletic trainers this morning about acceptance and and they were bringing it up and I tried to reinforce it as as thoroughly as I could that with that uncertainty that we keep talking about you know we can make plans but we accept that those plans might change you know within the same day within the same week within I guess same minute sometimes so uh, I, just right along those same lines I think that's so important that we accept what is it is and the fact that we don't have to know, you know, our athletes are coming to us, asking us questions, especially coaches and administration, and, and we don't have the answer. And I think sometimes that extra pressure of feeling like we need to have the answer doesn't help our own mental health. So being able to, like Trevor said, kind of accept the fact that we don't have as much control over things as we typically would like to, and we really don't know the answer. You know, I had an athlete ask me, I don't understand um, how or why I need to social distance when I'm in a social setting, but then I'm playing a contact sport. And I was like, you know what? That is a great <laughs> question that I don't have the answer to, but let's talk about that and kind of what you're feeling around that. So not feeling like we have to answer their questions and have um, all their needs and create this structure that we don't really have right now. 
Yeah, well said, Monique. I, you know, it's, it's uh, Tyler, you said it's kind of the psychology of uncertainty. And, um, and we know that the great performers and great athletes embrace uncertainty. And uh, that's what they prepare for. They prepare for dealing with the uncertainties of the circumstances and their opponents as they increase the certainty of their approach. Um, and so I, I love that people are, that the athletes are asking these questions. And even if they seem a little foolish or like, like Trevor was saying, um, oh, maybe if I get it, you know, that's an athlete who's thinking, I, want, I need to do something. And I want to help them kind of move toward what are those some things that are potentially the most healthy and um, effective for them. Um, but that pursuit of what can I do is such a great thing. Uh, the worst one is you come in and you just feel absolutely helpless. And it's like, um, even if they're saying that, it's like, you can, I like that you're talking about that because <clears throat> that's something you can do and something we can walk through. Well, something that I would just add really quickly too, with that idea of accepting and embracing something I talk to our athletes about all the time too, to normalize it is when you accept something or you're embracing it, you don't necessarily have to like it, right? And so obviously there's a lot of things happening this fall that aren't ideal and that we're not necessarily going to like per se, but is that going to help you if we're fighting against it constantly versus kind of opening ourselves up to it, even if we don't like it? I think another thing we, uh, we did at OU is trying to help them identify that line of, okay, I'm having some psychological distress at one point, should I be reaching out for help? Um, so one of the things I did with our staff specifically last week, we had a, an hour long presentation with uh, different uh, professionals talking about their certain areas and, and how to come back to work in, in a healthy way with COVID. And, and so I talked about uh, peritrauma so they can learn a little bit about what it's like being in a potentially traumatic event currently and what you do to identify uh, the risk and what can you do to avoid uh, having post-traumatic stress with that. And so I talked about uh, some uh, three clusters of symptoms. So the intrusive thoughts, uh, avoidance of, of, of triggers and stimuli, and then the negative alterations in mood and feelings of guilt and things like that. So to help them identify, if I'm starting to have some of these symptoms as I'm approaching the workplace for the first time in, in five months and I start feeling those physiological uh, signs of anxiety. Um, so uh, they can just be aware of, of those symptoms uh, and then follow it up with like, here's what you do about it. But then also quickly talked about OCD and when does cleaning uh, become more uh, obsessive compulsive? So uh, how do we not become the Monica, Monica Gellers uh, of the world and, and make sure that we're having a healthy attitudes towards keeping a, a safe environment? So I talked about uh, the two main clusters of uh, compulsive behaviors and then uh, the obsessive thoughts. And, you know, here's, if you're doing this, here's when I reach out to pros and uh, we'll help you kind of work through that. But give us some education and follow up with tools uh, to help prevent potential more severe pathology along the way. But also in that message, Cody, you're doing a lot of normalizing of the range of normal and healthy responses to, to what's happening around. And, I found validation of this to be very powerful with all levels of the department, you know, telling the athletes, you are the first college athletes that have ever had to had to go through something like this. And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, that's a big deal what we're doing. And so just putting words on this is hard. This is a big deal. And that that can and you can just kind of see the relief and the understanding, you know, wash over them. So normalizing, validating. I think those are all really important things to be um, sharing with our folks. And one other I mean, those are all great points. And we've also just thrown out there the importance of sleep and because stress impacts our sleep big time and I haven't talked to anybody who's sleeping well during all of this. So if anybody is, throw your tips <laughs> this way. Um, but just reiterating and like we're saying, normalizing that and just reminding them, hey, get the best sleep you can. It's one easy little quick tip to try to make your day that much easier to deal with. Excellent. We, we touched on this a little bit, but we were hoping to, to talk about it a little bit more thoroughly. Just we're curious how this period of multiple challenges being the COVID response, the uh, concerns that the Black, Live, um, Black Lives Matter movement has brought to the forefront, 
uh, the uncertainty of sport participation. How has all, all these different things, and many, many more, how have all these impacted your work on a daily basis? Right, again, it's like there's so many different lenses to look through the student athlete experience, or if someone's coming into the therapy room for a particular reason, here are an additional ways you're having to kind of think through like, okay, someone's struggling with, with family concerns or relationship concerns, but also kind of putting, you know, putting it on the table and thinking about how this might be intersecting with that as well. I think I'm just trying to be, be mindful about um, just kind of looking at, at it and making sure I'm, I'm viewing things through those lenses. Or even, you know, one of the things I'm uh, reminded of is our athletic department um, put on like a unity walk this past weekend for our student athletes um, who wanted to have their own walk um, to really support the Black Lives Matter movement and really point to trying to, especially within our Lubbock community, um, find a way to start making some meaningful changes around social injustice, racial injustice, and you know, being able to highlight that on social media, athletes speaking out and really saying beautiful things about the change that they want to see and how stressful that can be to be vulnerable. And then seeing obviously negative comments that are coming up on social media. And, and I've just kind of been aware this week with our, you know, with some of our football uh, student athletes that have spoken out and, you know, I'm wondering, are they, are they reading those comments? Are they getting bogged down in those things and just recognizing how that, is an, again another layer uh, to all this as well. Yeah, and speaking of lenses, Tyler, I'm I've also over the past few weeks been reminded of the personal and the professional for me lens. So not only am I responsible for helping folks deal with the ways these things are you know, intersecting in their own lives and providing sport, support around that for them. I'm at the same time managing my own personal, you know, fears and apprehensions and decision making processes. And so that's been a challenge more recently. You know, do we send the kids to school? How do we balance schedules? You know, my own, that's personal. And it, it, I'm working very hard to step into my professional lens um, and it's taking more effort and energy than it, than it has in the past because of all of these intersecting challenges. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. You know, just recognizing that we are also collectively grieving and collectively weary from COVID. And so it kind of puts this new spin on what is self-care and how do you hold your own stuff while also um, holding space for your athletes and, and other people who, who need that. So I think it's just, I agree that that's been one of the hardest pieces is just this personal and professional and trying to balance the two and, and make sure that, you know, we are taking care of ourselves also, since it's so important. Um, if we don't take care of ourselves. Obviously we're not going to do our student athletes justice either. So a lot of day by day at this point, it feels like. Yeah, I think there's a lot of balancing in a lot of different ways. Um, just thinking about the few things like COVID, Black Lives Matter, our sports and whether or not that's going to happen in the fall. And so when I'm thinking about like programming, you know, we're, we're a staff of two. So we're working on this programming around uh, maybe Black Lives Matter and the social unrest. And it's like, but we still got these other things that we need to do programming and do outreach and make sure we're checking on our student athletes. Um, Cody talked about our, our PPE or our mental health screen. We did some changes to that and it got kind of long. and <laughs> They've been longer than they've ever been before because we're trying to check all of these things and check on our athletes in a lot of different ways. So just kind of that part of balancing too. I also think it's important to teach the student athletes that it's okay to talk about these things. These are issues that they typically don't have to talk about in mental health spaces because there hasn't been a pandemic in their lifetime before, uh, intersecting with Black Lives Matter and everything else. And so for me, it's about recognizing my stimulus value as a white identified male therapist as well, and not waiting for them to bring up the issues and go ahead and screen to see how this is all affecting them. Um, and normalizing that it's okay to talk about it. This is a safe place that we can talk about it.
we've been touching on this a little bit as we're talking about, you know, balancing the personal and professional um, parts of our identities and things like that. And I'm just kind of thinking back to when all this first happened in March and just what's unfolded in these past five months or however long it's been for you all. What have we learned about ourselves, I guess, and life um, during this time that you that you think will you'll take with you into the future or that will potentially enhance your work in the future? I realized how much I rely on the, the ebb and the flow of the school year and I'm not getting that ebb this summer. So learn that. Longest spring break ever. I think it's, it's taught us how resourceful we can be. Um, Cause I'm on, I'm on several different professional organizations, not just sports psychology, but also mental health related. And I feel like as a sports psychology community, we responded pretty quickly uh, with, okay, here's now how we're going to deliver services. I mean, we went to Zoom before anyone else really knew what Zoom was. Like, we were there, and uh, I feel like just kind of proud of uh, of all you guys and us as a field as, as far as uh, how resilient we are uh, to make sure that we're always going to be there to support the student athletes and staff and find ways to provide that care, whether it's figuring out how to do meetings like this, which we haven't done before, figuring out how to do programming, which we've never done before. So we're definitely providing services out of our areas of expertise because no one had that area of expertise of providing services in the middle of a pand pandemic. So uh, I feel like we're, we're, we're all very quick learners and uh, taking that forward makes me feel confident that like, okay, huh, whatever the back half of 2020 is gonna show us, like I feel like we're not prepared for it, but I feel like we can be resilient and figure out how to manage it, okay? Yeah, resilience, what a great, an important term, you know, I, we, during these times, yeah, I relearn our humanity, um, how human we all are, um, vulnerable we all can be, uh, despite the pursuit of excellence and strength and health, um, and, um, and, and it levels the playing field um, for students, professionals, children, the elderly. Um, and so there's, I know there's actually a unifying thing that can and, and usually does come from uh, different um, uh, kind of universal challenges like this. Um, another thing I'm re reminded of, um, which is not always, a, doesn't always feel like a positive thing, but how much we're needed um, and uh, how much people are hurting and the importance of what we do, uh, the value of self-care because of that. Um, these are all good important reminders for us. I was reminded to practice what I preach. And that's one thing that I've learned, like Annie was talking about mindfulness. It's definitely been upped in my life. I've been doing more meditation, just uh, being a good example to those around me by utilizing the same self-care, saying, hey, I, I need to take a day. Um, um, we also mentioned how we're balancing personal stuff. So trying to find a healthy balance in that and being vocal about, you know, I got a kid and I don't have child care today, so I'm gonna work from home today. So um, being able to find my voice in that and some things and utilize some of the skills that I've learned that I help other people with, but use them for myself. So those are some of the things that I was reminded of. And like Cody said, I'm very proud of how tech savvy I've become. Like I started a mental health YouTube channel, like I'm doing a YouTube channel, like I'm very proud of some of these things, these skills that I've learned um, during this time, so. Along those lines of practicing what we preach, um, remind myself it's, okay, it's not okay, it's important to be vulnerable uh, during this time, going from one topic from the next to the next to try to help meet the needs of, of everybody in the department and just reminding that on myself, I have needs too. And if I don't get those needs met, you know, my battery is gonna get pretty low and then my, my services aren't gonna be near as effective. And so I'm very fortunate to have a, a wonderful wife in this field as well who, who reminds me that over dinner and so um, I'm lucky that I have that built-in support system and, and, and someone who reminds me of that on a regular basis so that's a challenge uh, 
when we're you know constantly on the go, but it's it's an important challenge that I try to remind myself of too. I think that's a good point, Trevor. I, I think I was struggling with this question. I'm sitting here thinking like, what what have I learned? So like, did I did I grow from this? Um, and, I, and I think for me, it really was like, I think the the social distancing and the quarantining just it highlighted for me something I already knew about myself and that it's so easy to get focused on what we do professionally um, and check out of our personal relationships, um, especially when there's not those built-in mechanisms to go, you know, maybe grab some food after work with friends or just do something on the weekend and trying to be more intentional about the ways in which I communicate to the people that are important to me in my life. Um, again, it's still a struggle, but I think I at least, it, I learned how important it was to me and I'm still trying to figure out how to best incorporate that into my life and balance that personal and professional sense of self. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, that, that's definitely something that I've, I think if I, if I've grown in any way, that's one thing that's really come out of this for me. And I'm sure I'm not the only one um, with this, how much I relied on the sporting events for my social outlets. All of a sudden they're out and, and before you know it, you know, I've gone however long without, you know, seeing this friend or that friend. And, and so being intentional about finding ways to connect is, is, um, is something that I recently came to that realization. Yeah, I think one of the big things that just has come up for me over and over is just self-compassion and, you know, giving myself grace through this period. Because again, like we're also going through a pandemic for the first time and having to navigate um, holding spaces for ourselves and for others. And then, you know, virtually, I really appreciate that I can do my job virtually and can still connect to students, but I really do miss the in-person connection of therapy. Um, I think it's just as therapists, a lot of time, that's just what we thrive on is that human interaction. And, and kind of the last thing is just this idea of judgment, of grief, and, you know, making sure that we're not judging each other's grief process, um, just because it looks really different. Because obviously, by judging other people's grief, we just kind of isolate in our own. Um, and so just kind of goes back to this idea of mindfulness all over again, mindful self-compassion, mindful you know, self-care, all that sort of stuff. I've also, you know, I, I knew that sports were important, but I, I, I guess maybe I sort of assumed it was important to me in my sphere because I've grown up in it. Um, but this has really reminded me how important sports are globally, internationally, um, you know, to, in our communities, for our children, you know, you look at the news and it's like, are we going to have school and are we going to have sports? That's the, you know, the, the two prominent parts of discussion. And I've been really humbled by the way our athletes have used their power, used their voice and used their platform. Um, and it's been really nice to see and encouraging for our future as, as a country even. Well, I know we want to be mindful of the time um, and we've also, this has just been a fantastic conversation, um, but I know we, maybe one thing to kind of end on is like, I don't know, little pop culture, like give people little quick tips on self-care kind of thing. But we've talked about self-care um, throughout in various ways, talk about mindfulness and things like that. But if there were any other like quick tip takeaways that you would want to provide to student athletes or staff with like, here are a couple of things you can be doing right now from a self-care perspective, what would you want to share before we end today? I have two that come to mind right off the bat. Um, one that we kind of discovered this summer, I'm not sure if it's been around longer and we just were not um, attuned to it, but the School of Social Work in Buffalo, New York has an entire website devoted to making your own personal self-care plan. And it's really cool. It's a self-care toolkit and it, you know, it's an awesome rabbit hole. We've referred staff and students to it so that you know, when you face the stress, you have an automatic plan. You can go to your sheet of paper and go with that. Um, and the other one that we've been reiterating a lot 
is just how small tasks and small accomplishments, we've been calling them micro wins, but that those do release dopamine in our brains and help us feel accomplished right now when our other time anchors are missing. And so any chance that we can break down, you know, waking up and sitting up <laughs> is, is a micro win right now sometimes. And so breaking that stuff down so that they're feeling like they're accomplishing things when they can't leave their dorm room um, or their normal accomplishments are, are not available to them. So just having to change the mindset. Yeah, I like the way you frame that. I think the thing I've been putting out there is modified behavior is better than no behavior, right? And even if I think about it for myself, I miss going to the gym. I miss getting my regular workout in and having to challenge myself, you know, so I think it's very easy for me to be like, well, if I can't do that workout, then I'm not going to do anything. It's not going to be good enough and recognize like, there's definitely some middle ground there that I could get that micro win, so to speak. So I can share mine. Uh, so I have about a 15, 20 minute commute uh, to and from work. And so uh, on stressful days, I'll put on Pandora and I listen to stand up comedy. And so I can just laugh on the way home. Uh, or if I'm feeling tired and fatigued and lethargic, I'll put on uh, the workout station. So it's always upbeat music to kind of keep me going. So uh, I use that to kind of help me de-stress and motivate me. Nice. Yeah, one tip I would share is um, as we move forward and, and things are going to get way busier is um, to not, le not neglect the quiet. Um, it hasn't always felt good now because it's, so much of it is forced on us, but to not neglect those times of silence, quiet, uh, meditation, prayer, um, things that cause us to introspect and question um, and deepen, uh, really set aside time for that weekly, if not daily. I've actually been really proud of, of a lot of my athletes, and I think I shared this last time, that have been starting new things. And so oftentimes we used to hear them say how they don't have time to do this, and I wish I had more time to do that. And I'm like, now you have time to do that. So do those things now that you have time. So um, I've really been proud. I've got some sewing and some that are <laughs> taking up um, musical instruments and things of that nature and I've really enjoyed that and I think that'll be beneficial for them in the long run too because we don't know what the season is going to look like so they're already engaging in that and so that's been really great and and I encourage them to continue to do that and I've been doing the basic coloring myself <laughs> it's been really helpful for me it's something that I can do with my son but you know there's nothing mindless like coloring a big Mickey Mouse so I've enjoyed doing that <laughs> I like that idea of new things, right? So that's come up here and really challenging people like how opportunities for growth. And it just reminds me of thinking about how, you know, there's just this reality as elite athletes that your entire identity is about you know, the sport that you play, right? And obviously the thing that you do the most, it's going to be the biggest piece of the pie, but challenging people to really develop and, and cultivate a more, maybe a more dynamic or comprehensive sense of self and knowing that, you know, it's, it's helpful to have those different areas of yourself that you can lean on when maybe things aren't going as great in your sport or you can't really get any self-worth or self-esteem out of it because you're not playing, right? And so being able to lean on, well, hey, I, I really like to cook, so I'm going to take time to do that. Or, hey, I've really gotten into playing this musical instrument and that's a new piece of my identity. And really, you know, that's, you know, I've been trying to, I think athletes are starting to understand that, wow, just because I maybe devote a little bit less time thinking about or participating in my sport doesn't necessarily make me a worse athlete in some ways maybe it makes me better because I am more well balanced um, and it keeps me more protected from burnout and things like that and it's just so fun and refreshing to have those conversations with our student athletes when you, you brought up cooking and uh, just last week having a, had a conversation with a student athlete and when I started talking about you know what food do you miss from home and his eyes just lit up and he started talking about this and he started talking about that and I said well, you know, you can probably get some of that stuff at the local grocery store and probably impress your, uh, your teammates. And then before we knew it, um, bouncing ideas back and forth, he's going to work with the sports nutritionist and try and start a kind of like a little cooking competition amongst the team. It's kind of a team building thing. And so it's fun just to, you know, learn about their culture and learn about those things that are important to them. And, you know, whether it be that, you know, another student athlete, it was, it was painting. He hadn't done painting in a long time. Hey, pretty easy fix. You know, go get some stuff and 
start putting it up there. And so it's just fun to meet them where they're at. And, and Malik, like you said, you do have time now. All right, let's get it in the routine. So that way, when you start to get busier, maybe it's not as long you're doing that, but you're still doing it. A couple of quick things I, I use is just be with your feet, wherever your feet are. Let your mind and your awareness be there also. And that social distancing does not have to mean emotional distancing. So find ways to emotionally connect, use FaceTime, you know, practice vulnerability and open sharing with those you trust and love and feel loved by. A few things I would add um, with just, you know, the, important, uh, the importance of, of sunlight and making sure that you're getting it, not just for mood, but for sleep purposes as well. Um, and the important of transitions throughout our day since we don't have our typical time anchors. So, you know, if you are usually stuck in your room right now, after school work, when you're done for the day, can you go take a walk? You know, things like that just to get your body um, kind of refreshed and a brain break. Um, and then last, just the importance of expressing gratitude. Um, you know, kind of this attitude of gratitude for the things that we can control just because it, it will help you know, decrease your stress levels if you can hold, if you can hold that also. I love that gratitude piece and kind of like what we were saying, we're also used to very high, fast paced environments and we don't have our sports competitions to go to as much anymore and things like that. And just for me, especially this time over the summer and just feeling grateful for like where I live in Morgantown and hey, I'm like 10, 15 minute drive to the lake, paddle boarding way more often now and things like that. So the things that now that we have time to do that we didn't necessarily have time to do before and just like we're um, having our athletes do the same thing. So just thank you all again so much um, for chatting today and engaging in our second round table conversation um, regarding mental health considerations for returning to campus during the current coronavirus pandemic. Um, this has been a great conversation as we all prepare for a very different fall on our respective campuses and um, I'm always grateful for having the opportunity to be a part of this group and Trevor and I just want to thank you all again for your contributions to the discussion today um, and helping us prepare as best as we can for the upcoming weeks and months. Um, we look forward to continuing these roundtable conversations again next month as we continue to share information regarding student athlete mental health and advocate for our services within collegiate athletics. Thank you.